Hello and welcome to EJC News Focus. Cancer researchers today have access to an unprecedented level of detail from genetics, epigenetics, proteomics and so on. Our knowledge has taken off exponentially. At the same time, day-to-day -day life for many of those trying to translate this new understanding into clinical advances involves steering a course around rather more prosaic obstacles, including bureaucratic red tape and funding applications. Roger Stupp has taken over as president of VORTC. So is this a good time to be involved in clinical research? You have to take the time as it is. Is it a good time to live this century or last century? I think times are exciting. There is a lot of changes. There is a lot of knowledge. The amount of knowledge we acquire on, uh, from preclinical work, from genetics, from epigenetics, from proteomics, from uh, metabolomics is enormous. Now we have to translate this. So in that respect, it's a great time to be in clinical research. If I look at regulations, at complications, at lack of funding, um, at difficulties, at wrong incentives, then maybe it's not the best time to be in clinical research. But that's the challenges we have, and we are the generation here. We have to face it. How optimistic are you that the changes being discussed at the moment um, to the regulation for clinical trials w will be positive? You know, when you're an oncologist, you're always optimistic, otherwise you change jobs. So. Uh, Yes, I hope we have been heard and uh, at the Europe European Commission and so on. So we hope that there is uh, some change for the better. But as you know, things take time and it takes almost too much time forgetting that there are patients on the other side who are actually waiting for more clinical trials, for more answers, for more integration of our basic research knowledge into the ultimate uh, trial and test. Specifically, what changes do you think need to be included? I think we want simplification. I think we need to uh, get trials activated uh, more quickly. We need to get uh, trials uh, being funded in different ways, somewhat away from only industry and pharma sponsored, so we can also pursue questions which there is no commercial interest, e.g. Uh, surgery trials, even uh, like radiation therapy trials, or uh, trials looking at lower doses, different dose schedules, all these things which only the academic field can do. Also uh, integration of uh, new discoveries early on in the clinical trial, I think that uh, needs to be changed. Also, the directive right now, if you go by the letter, requests that all treatment is provided within the trial, so even the standard of care. So how can you improve? How, you, uh, how can you really materialize on quality assurance as you do a clinical trial, optimize established treatments? You cannot do that under the current directive. Do you feel that the academic point of view has been taken sufficiently seriously this time? I'm not sure I'm confident. I think, uh, and it's not necessarily that the academics have not been heard, but if you want to have a regulation with one fits it all, then it's just not going to work. There are different kind of questions we need now to have risk adapted uh, design of trials. It's not the same whether you run a first in man trial on a compound which is completely novel, uh, which has never been used before or you adapt or try to optimize a dose or a schedule of an established and marketed drug. So these are complete different things. Does the very nature of clinical trials have to change? We all realize that we cannot run trials with thousands of patients forever and it doesn't make sense just to show a marginal benefit. So I think we need to learn more early on when we, uh, when we start developing new treatments and here to learn a maximum. So look at, uh, at imaging, look at uh, tissue, look at genetics, uh, look at epigenetics, look what has been changing. Uh, and then you name it and it's proteomics, but very often, unfortunately, everything is limited by economics. So here we ha really have a limitation. Do you feel that the regulators are on board here? I think they are. In principle, they are. I think, uh, and the regulators overall are very reasonable. They want to be convinced that what we do is safe and that uh, that's what is their role. And they want to be at the end be convinced that the effect we see is real. 
Now, uh, of course, as we're looking, when we try to uh, prove a minimal effect, then everything else has to be perfect. Uh, the bigger the effect, the, the more the regulator is be willing to go along. So I think sometimes we are too much on the defensive side and saying it's all on the regulator. I hope both academia and industry gets a little bit of gut saying, we'll do it, we know it is right, we believe in it and, uh, and do it right. But also then be honest when the effect is marginal and not touting a huge benefit when the benefit at best is marginal, which may still have implication as we learn something, but the effect, the benefit for the individual patient is not as big um, to justify huge prices or even justify uh, to have the a drug or new treatment marketed. So we need to be looking for meaningful clinical benefit rather than a statistical improvement in survival. Absolutely. I think uh, it is really important that we have a meaningful benefit. Now, how to define the meaningful benefit is a different story. Um, of course, we often mean quality of life, but we measure overall survival because that's the one thing we know how to measure best. So better surrogate endpoints, metabolic imaging um, uh, can help here. And there are examples where we could show early on with PET imaging, for instance, that after two or four weeks of treatment that you see who is responding or not. So you can also discontinue a treatment as early as possible. Are you worried about the current political discussions on data protection? So here it's another of those absolute contradictions in our lives. Here we have high data protection. Everything has to be anonymized. Of course, the patient who comes to the big hospital says, I don't want to be a number, I want to be a person. So here they put, uh, force us not even using initials, uh, which is just going to add to confusion and add to making mistakes. I would think that 99% of all the data has no real value to be protected. That doesn't mean you have to tout it around or you have to be careless, but it really, who cares what is Roger Stoops hemoglobin level? Uh, so even if this would be available, it doesn't really matter. Um, so here we probably have to come back to something reasonable. Patients don't care about data protection, they care about better treatments. And I think we need really to care about that, what they care, to provide better treatments and stop repeating our mistakes over and over again because uh, we refuse to learn from every patient we treat. What part does EORTC have to play in moving towards this goal? It is really a mission of collaborative research rather than everybody on his own. And it has shown and proven that if we put our forces together that we can achieve more. Now, of course, nowadays things have be, are so complex, EORTC by itself is also too small. So as we get to more and more targeted treatments, there are no two diseases that are exactly the same. So we need even a larger network. We have done trials jointly sponsored with EORTC and industry and had worldwide endeavors and are able this way to identify and recruit, even in rare diseases, three, four thousand patients in two years' time. So uh, here, the collaborative effort really pays off. And that's what ERTC stands for, to do research and to collaborate. Collaboration, then, is the only way ahead for clinical research. And with thanks to Roger Stupp, that's it for this month's EJC News Focus.